Um, I'm talking about my research, which is on Queen Tom. Some of you may know me. I've been doing various labs and things. I've been here for the last three semesters. This is my last semester, so uh, I'm very busy at the moment writing up my thesis, and all my data is done. So that's why I've actually got some results for you, which is awesome. I literally just finished showing these results like yesterday. So you are the first. Um, I want to start in the beginning. <laughs> So once upon a time, that was me. Um, I'm actually from the UK, obviously. Um, where I'm originally from is in the north. You can see, try this out. The house of that in the north. Um, where I'm from is, I say I'm from near Manchester, which is a complete lie, but no one knows where I'm from. Um, I'm actually from a village with other 400 people. There's no shops, but there's a lot of sheep. And then when I went to university, I moved down south to the University of Exeter, which is a lovely seaside town and still, yeah, no city life. So I got my undergraduate in zoology. Um, I took maybe a six month break and then I came here to St. Kitts to study my masters in histopathology. So back to Queen Conk. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about them. You might have seen them in the waters around St. Kitts. They're really distinctive because of their pink lip. Um, and also people seem to think they're quite tasty. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you find them all throughout the Caribbean region from Florida in the north, Venezuela in the south, and Mexico is about as far um, west as they go. Um, we have them obviously down in St. Kitts around here, um, but they tend to prefer kind of inshore waters, you don't find them in the deeps, so they're definitely focused around islands, island masses. There we go. Um, they have internal fertilization, so we have very distinct male and females. Uh, they are not filter feeders like a lot of people think, they actually are detritivores on the benthos. So they feed on like dead algae and um, dead seagrasses, things like that. They have little pincer in their mouth, so they go and chew on all of those. Um, they go from mating, they lay these egg masses in the shallow sands, and they're very, very sticky. So they're basically giant sea snails, and so the sticky eggs kind of like a mass sand, and that hides them. They become villagers, they're free floating for about three weeks until they metamorphosize into tiny, tiny conks. So they look just like the big ones, but they're absolutely weeny. And they hide in the, uh, in the sand for a couple of years um, until their dietary requirements become too great. They move further offshore into seagrass beds where they're kind of better adapted for the predation. Unfortunately, it takes them about two or three, well, two or three years, maybe four years to mature. So um, they actually reach their full size, which the big ones you see um, kind of the fishermen are selling. Some of them are not mature, even once they've reached their full size. If you take anything away from today, I would ask you please only ever fish or eat the conch that have the flare lip, which is when they really start to mature. They flare their lip, and the thicker the lip, the older they are, because they deposit their shell like throughout their life. So you get the ones with like a good two, three centimeter thick lip. Those guys are probably like 20, 30 years old. So um, they just keep on depositing it throughout their life. Uh, Obviously, people do think they're tasty. Um, I did try them once. Christian made me try the cone because I've never eaten it. <laughs> it wasn't that hard to make you try. It was. Okay. <laughs> peach fest is peach fest, okay. So, um, <laughs> I'm really excited the peach fest. Um, so, yeah, people think they're super tasty. Um, they're severely overfished uh, throughout the Caribbean. In the 70s, there was a huge crash in stocks, which caused CITES to get involved. Um, the IUCN still hasn't like actually given them the status because they're native deficient. Um, but because stocks have been like decreasing so much, there's lots more fishing regulations. And in 1983, Florida like put a complete ban on all of their fishing, um, which is interesting because out of all the Caribbean exports, the U.S. imports 80% of all of the sales. So um, Florida says no, but they're still contributing a huge amount to all of the conks that they're, they're harvesting in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about my research. Um, the trouble in St. Kitts is that um, while we do have very small fisheries, it's mostly domestic, from about 1990, um, say the exports were about uh, 2,000 kilograms. In 1995, it peaked at 11,000 kilograms because the demand was just increasing so much. And then recently, from about 2010, we've decreased again to maybe 6,000 kilograms. But I think this is mostly due to kind of the increased effort to find a conch. It's nothing to do with conservation efforts. We did have some fishing regulations come in in 1995. So there's size restrictions, uh, there's length of the shell, there's the weight of the meat. But because it's legal for the fishermen to deshell them in the water, I don't know if you've been out snorkeling, you've seen the conch graveyards. They just like deshell them when they're in the boat offshore. It's very hard to monitor, and there's no way to enforce it anyway because it's St. Kitts. So um, there's really uh, no, you know monitoring in that sense. And the last report of the conch abundance of St. Kitts was in 1982. Um, so unfortunately, I was trying to work with the Department of Marine Resources. They really wanted me to do an abundance survey, but it's not what I 
I'm here for, so that's what they really need to improve their, their management, uh, management plans, if you like. So I mentioned I'm here to do a queen conscious survey of health. Um, I use history pathology to do this, but it's not as simple as it sounds because, uh, you know, you got the conch. We're getting them is hard enough because I need them alive, so I can't just buy them from the fisherman anyhow. I have to kind of speak to certain people and get them to call me as soon as they come ashore, and then I'm going to pick them up and then try and keep them alive in various ways. But I still need to get from a whole conch to my slides where I can do my data analysis, um, which was a trial and error, um, but we got there eventually. <laughs> These are all the stages. <laughs> Uh, we start with the big cog, and the first thing to do is trying to get them out of the shell. Now, getting them out of the shell gets them very stressed, and because they're giant snails, their main response is to just produce a lot of mucus. Like, so much mucus is disgusting. Necropsies are just always just gross, very sticky. And um, so, in order to keep them de stressed, I wanted to anesthetize them, make them calm, relax, and also, even though they're invertebrates, so they're not covered under like, the um, eye cook ethical laws at all. So, it's completely, you can kill them, there's no ethical responsibilities to do with that, but I, it makes me feel unhappy to do that, so I like to put them uh, under anesthetic first as well, make sure they're all chilled out and hopefully they don't feel any pain. But that's a, a whole other philosophical debate. <laughs> um, from the, yeah, extracting them. So I figured out how to um, kind of sedate them. Uh, we tried three or four different techniques. Um, you can tell straight away if they like it or not. Like I put them in a bucket with uh, salt water and clove oil and they like were freaking out immediately. Their foot comes out and they start trying to get away. Um, we find out that magne uh, magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salts, you sometimes use to like clean your feet. I don't really know why people would use Epsom salts, but you can buy it at the pharmacy. Um, and that really like chills them out. Leave them in that for about an hour or two and you take them out. And normally when you pick them up, they are really 